Chapter Ten of Rescue Dog of the High Pass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rescue Dog of the High Pass by Jim Kilgard. The House of the Dead. Franz braced the sole of his shoe against the blade of his shovel, took a big bite of snow, and threw it high above his head. Even cows, Anton Martek had told him, or especially cows, might lose their faith if they could never see daylight. How could they see daylight if the windows of their stable were darkened by snow? And how could the snow be removed unless someone shoveled it away? Franz thought grimly that at last he knew why the handles of the shovels at St. Bernard Hospice were a full three feet longer than any in Dornblatt. Caesar, lying on the snow six feet above the boy's head, wagged an amiable tail and grinned a canine grin. Franz glared at him. You might well smile, he glowered. You do no work at all. You refuse to even turn the spit caesar's tail wagged harder and his jaws parted a little more a little worm of worry gnawed at franz's heart since the deep snows had started except to go down to the rest house with father benjamin whenever it was the latter's turn to go the mastiff had been idle anton had worked patiently and endlessly to make him turn the spit and he was still working at it but caesar had discovered a simple ruse that foiled the most cunning scheme anton could devise he merely lay down wagged his tail beamed agreeably and refused to move at all not even anton cared to drag a hundred and fifty pound dog around and turn the spit with him franz looked beseechingly up at the big mastiff who was still lying on the snow and interestedly observing his master you should learn to do it he begged father benjamin already knows you will not work soon father martin or father stephen will discover that anton and i have been taking turns revolving the spit for you they will inform one of the canons who is sure to tell the prior and then you'll be sent away from the hospice which is entirely right and good and as it should be the fathers are not men of wealth who can afford to maintain such a big lazy loafer as yourself in idleness caesar wagged his tail a little harder as though he were being complimented franz looked sternly at him but could not find it in his heart to scold any more it will be very right and very just if you're sent away he said sadly but it will leave me so very lonesome caesar you must try franz turned back to his shoveling fastening his heart and mind on the one ray of hope that remained to him since the day of the blizzard when caesar had brought them safely to the hospice father benjamin had emphatically declared that any dog able to do such a thing was priceless but he was not going to be readily accepted there had been dogs at the hospice since its founding tradition said that bernard de menthon himself had one but tradition said also that it was the work of the priests and marineers at the hospice to succor travellers and that was why only men born to the mountains and skilled in mountain arts could be accepted for service there it had been that way for seven hundred years said father benjamin and anything that has existed for seven centuries is not lightly discarded franz should be of good cheer and while so being though he needn't dishonestly conceal the fact that caesar was doing no work he needn't advertise it either gentle persuasion according to father benjamin was far more effective than raging or bullying when it came to breaking a wall of custom that was seven hundred years old meanwhile whenever it was father benjamin's turn to go down to either rest house he would take caesar with him sooner or later he would prove the dog's value franz sighed and dug his shovel blade into the last of the snow caesar had accompanied father benjamin on every trip 
but on every trip father benjamin made the weather has been so fine that there had been no need for a rescue or any other kind of work franz threw the last of the snow out of the hole climbed out himself and at once slipped his feet into the skis that awaited him the snow at this altitude was hard and granular and not at all similar to the soft stuff that often covered the lower reaches the hard snow plus caesar's huge paws kept him from sinking more than a few inches and he rose to greet his master with furiously wagging tail franz caught up his shovel smoothed the snow he had thrown out and turned to look about him the grand st bernard pass was indeed locked in the grip of winter with snow piled high about the hospice and drifts lying at intervals but the day had started out very well and fathers stephen and martin had gone down to the rest houses on the north and south slopes in order to bring up any travellers waiting there franz turned uneasily on his skis the day was still fine but there were a few clouds where none had been earlier and an undercurrent that spoke of fury to be it was a hint that only a born mountaineer could feel at all but franz resolutely banished his fears father stephen had three years of experience at the hospice and father martin seven they were well able to take care of themselves franz moved to the stable door slipped out of his skis and entered anton martek sitting on a bile of hay and honing an axe looked up and grinned Tomorrow, he prophesied you shall have all of it to do over again so you sense the storm coming too franz asked i sense nothing anton said serenely for to do so is very silly i live for the moment that is not the one that will be and that proves me either a great fool or a very wise man i do not know which and do not care but anyone knows that snow may fall at any time now in grand st bernard pass therefore it is evident that you will do your shoveling all over again to-morrow franz said it is very great labor it is life at the hospice returned anton he patted caesar's massive head if you did not like the life you would not be here as for this great loafer it is no wonder he enjoys it for he has nothing whatever to do if the prior finds out franz said worriedly caesar will not be living at the hospice any more trust in god and father benjamin anton advised by the time the prior discovers the supposed worthlessness of this mighty eater caesar's worth will be known it should be known by this time franz pointed out father benjamin told of how caesar prevented his falling into the crevasse and then found a safe path some of the fathers smiled at him for they said it was no great blizzard anyhow as it was not anton remarked franz went on some said it was god who saved us and do you doubt that it was anton asked no franz admitted but caesar had something to do with it too why cannot he be given due credit you have not learned the lesson of patience anton told him that is not surprising because no youth has i tell you everything will be all right i hope so franz said gloomily now since all this thinking has pained me i will clean the stable a worthy endeavor anton said and one well calculated to remove your mind from your own troubles caesar threw himself down on a pile of hay pillowed his head on his paws and went to sleep franz started cleaning the stable he sighed again it would be nice if he were wise like father benjamin or even like anton for then he would know so many things that otherwise he could never hope to know since he was stupid and knew nothing except how to work with his hands he must find contentment in such work presently he found it and became so absorbed in what he was doing that he was startled by anton's voice saying we must close the shutters for it is starting to snow 
franz looked up to discover that the stable never bright as long as snow was heaped around the shutter openings had grown noticeably dimmer he hurried to help close the shutters anton lighted his candle lantern and hung it on the peg with the shutters closed the scream of the wind died to a soft moaning caesar rose to pace beside franz as though in doing so he was somehow standing between his master and the storm the four gentle cows never doubting they would be cared for munched their hay in the fitful light of the candle lantern anton's massive face looked strangely sober it will be well for one of us to have his supper and then the other little franz he said the storm will not grow less and one of us should be here to reassure the cows if the wind screams too loudly do you want to go first no you go franz urged very well the giant opened the stable door braced against the wind slipped into his skis closed the door and was gone franz huddled very close to caesar while the four cows stamped and munched he shuddered not in fear but with awe this was what winter in st bernard pass truly meant the wind that sounded inside the stable as a doleful moan was a screaming demon outside a strong man would have to struggle just to stand against it twenty minutes later the stable door opened and anton came back he carried a bowl and a dish i have brought your supper little franz for you must remain here he said there is very great trouble father stephen had only now come into the refectory he is almost spent a traveller missing from the rest house has not arrived at the hospice and father stephen has been searching for him what now franz asked with some alarm anton replied we all go little franz the fathers and the mariners alike all search for that traveller until he is found that is our only reason for being here i will eat quickly and be ready at once franz said anton smiled gently not you little franz you stay here it was caesar and i who found emil gottschalk franz asserted we have searched for lost travellers before but never in st bernard pass during a storm anton reminded him please franz began anton said shortly you stay here anton left and franz looked dejectedly at the closed stable door he ate his supper and blew the candle out for candles must not be wasted a dozen times during the night he awakened sure that anton had returned but it was not until past noon of the following day during a lull in the storm that anton did return from the stable door franz watched the giant marinier and two priests of the hospice all three were on skis and anton carried a blanket wrapped object that had the size and shape of a man it couldn't possibly be a man for men were not like that franz watched with staring eyes as the three went to the house of the dead and when they left it anton no longer carried his burden End of chapter 10chapter 11 of rescue dog of the high pass this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org rescue dog of the high pass by jim kilgard caesar's sentence before the storm spent itself snow lay twelve feet deep in grand st bernard pass and some of the drifts were three times as deep every cliff and slope held a huge burden of snow but it was not a burden willingly accepted and the danger increased a hundred times over enough snow to mould an ordinary snowball might be wind-blown and start more which in turn gathered more finally carrying boulders ice and everything else that lay in its path an all-destroying avalanche would roar down 
such avalanches were a daily occurrence on the peaks about the hospice franz stood in front of the stable caesar beside him he was watching the sun glance from the surrounding peaks wherever it touched snow or ice it gave back a reflection so dazzling that to face it for more than a few minutes meant to risk blindness a million jewels franz thought a hundred million jewels and each one more brilliant than the brightest ornament in any emperor's crown the hospice itself with ski trails radiating in every direction like the spokes of a giant wagon wheel was banked high with snow except for the house of the dead toward which he looked only when he could not avoid doing so franz thought it the most beautiful sight he had ever seen anton martek sitting on a chair beside the stable's open door fashioning a ski pole did not look up from his work a complete craftsman regardless of whether he was honing an axe making a ski pole milking a cow skiing or doing anything else anton believed wholeheartedly that anything worth doing was worth doing well and it could not be done well unless it received his undivided attention presently franz saw a man leave the refectory and ski toward the stable it was father mark who smiled when he came near and said good afternoon franz and a very good afternoon to you father mark franz replied have the travellers come up not yet father mark told him but fathers stephen and benjamin have gone down to guide them on a day such as this let us hope there will be no trouble let us hope so franz agreed he felt a pang of sorrow father benjamin who always took caesar with him when he went down to the rest house had not even told franz he was going but it was not his place franz reminded himself to tell the fathers what they should or should not do if father benjamin had not asked for caesar it was because he did not want him anton martek stood up respectfully and said good afternoon father mark and to you anton father mark noted the half-finished ski pole busy as usual i see well they do say satan finds work for idle hands anton said i fear he has found enough for mine tut tut father mark reproved you must not be gloomy on a day so fine the prior would speak with you at once anton said he slipped into his skis and departed with father mark franz stared wistfully after them he himself had seen the prior in the chapel or from a distance but he had never dared even think of speaking with him on those few occasions when their paths would have crossed and they could not have avoided speaking franz had fled as swiftly as possible winter in st bernard pass inspired awe but it was not nearly as awe-inspiring as the prior of st bernard hospice franz picked up and inspected the ski pole anton was fashioning and he tried to fix each detail exactly in his mind making proper skis or ski poles was more than just a craft it was a very precise art and one that franz hoped to master some day good was not enough in the alps who ventured out on skis took his life in his hands and must have perfection a few minutes later anton returned alone he did not look at franz when he said the prior would talk with you with me franz said bewilderedly you anton said franz protested but i cannot talk with the prior i fear you have no choice little franz and told told him the prior awaits in the refectory franz asked fearfully what does he want anton that you must discover for yourself anton replied franz pleaded go with me anton yes anton said quietly i will go with you franz put on his skis and with caesar trailing they went to the refectory the boy's head reeled his heart fluttered like the wings of a trapped bird at the entrance to the refectory he could go no farther come little franz anton urged gently yes anton franz shivered dressed in the habit of his order 
the prior sat before a pile of logs that smouldered in the huge fireplace with him and almost as hard to face were two of the cannons the cloven deer whose task it was to watch over the hospice provisions and two priests franz clasped his hands behind him so nobody could see them shake and wished mightily that the floor would open up so he could sink through it it is time we met young marinier the prior said i like to know all who share this work with me but for some reason we have never spoken y yes most holy prior franz stammered there is nothing to fear the prior said it was a very gentle voice and when franz took courage to look he saw also that though it was a weather-scarred and storm-beaten the prior's was a very gentle face the boy felt more at ease i am not afraid he said that is good the prior approved i wear the prior's habit and you are a marineer but for all that we are equal i have received excellent reports of your diligence and industry you are a credit to the hospice thank you most holy prior franz said the prior smiled knowing he should not be addressed in such a fashion but understanding why he was he continued now that we have finally met i would that it were for a different reason i fear that i have sad tidings for you for me franz's heart began to pound again you have a dog the prior said a great dog that according to our good clavendier eats a great amount of food and yet he does no work franz whispered miserably that is true believe me i understand what this dog means to you the prior was very gentle i hope to make you understand what the hospice of st bernard means to wayfarers every ounce of food we have here is far more precious than gold without it we could neither preserve our own lives nor provide for our guests it is a harsh order that i must issue franz but with the next travellers who are going there your dog must be returned to your native village of dornblatt for the moment franz was stricken speechless and then he spoke wildly please he begged please do not send caesar away most holy prior it is true that he will not turn the spit but he saved father benjamin from the crevasse he guided all of us safely to the hospice while a blizzard raged that tale i have heard the prior said and your caesar surely deserves all praise but as you have surely seen for yourself we have the welfare of travellers well in hand outside someone shouted those inside looked questioningly toward the door and one of the priests rushed to open it looking out franz saw two men on skis one was obviously injured the other was helping to support him the unhurt man was father benjamin the other was jean greb from franz's native dornblatt End of chapter 11chapter 12 of rescue dog of the high pass this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org rescue dog of the high pass by jim kilgard jean's story father mark and anton rushed to their skis and sped out to help the approaching pair father benjamin surrendered jean greb to the mighty anton and then knelt to undo the harness of jean's skis as though jean a big man weighed no more than a baby anton martek cradled him in his arms and carried him into the refectory he laid him tenderly on a pallet that the clavendier and one of the cannons had placed in front of the fire franz hung fearfully in the background while the prior himself who was skilled in the healing arts knelt beside the injured man and began to examine him jean had fought on while there was need for fighting now that the need no longer existed unconsciousness came i fear there is no hope for this man's companion father benjamin said in a low voice 
they were coming from the inn to the hospice when an avalanche rolled down upon them by a miracle alone this man was thrown to the top not even his skis were broken and when i discovered him he was trying to find his companion i thought it best even though he protested to bring him here with all possible speed it was wise to do so the prior said quietly the snows have claimed many lives had you let this man continue to search for his friend his life might have been lost too is jean badly hurt franz asked huskily the prior glanced up quickly do you know this man franz he's jean greb from my native village of dornblatt franz answered he's a very good friend to my family and myself put your heart at ease the prior's slim fingers ceased exploring jean's body there is very great shock which is not at all extraordinary after one has been the victim of an avalanche aside from that your friend seems to have suffered only a broken arm and some broken ribs it will be less painful for him if we take the proper measures while he still sleeps anton martek who had doubtless discovered jean's broken arm while carrying him to the hospice was suddenly there with splints father mark brought bandages and all the rest stood silently near while the prior set and splinted jean's broken arm and bound his ribs finished the prior reached for a flask of brandy that the clavendier had brought from his stores he forced a few drops between jean's lips waited a moment then gave the injured man a few more drops jean's eyelids fluttered he turned his head to one side and moaned then he opened his eyes and stared blankly the prior knelt before him with a small glass of brandy he cradled jean's head with one arm drink he said jean sipped slowly and as he did the color returned to his face and the life to his eyes he nibbled his own lips and then the shock faded and he returned to the world of rational beings his eyes found franz and an agony that was born of no physical pain twisted his face we came to see you franz he said in a husky whisper and i was the guide alas i was a very poor guide for the one who engaged me still lies in the snow it was not your fault the prior soothed no man can foresee an avalanche franz's heart turned over for none but the most important of reasons would any one have set out from dornblatt to visit him in st bernard pass were either of his parents or one of his sisters lost in the snow and not found were they beset by some terrible illness were i know there was a message jean continued but i was not the one who carried it who was the message from franz burst out jean said it was from emil gottschalk emil gottschalk franz asked bewilderedly the same jean said it was only two weeks ago that he was able to leave the hospital at martigny and return to dornblatt he's lost one of his feet but that seems to make small difference for he has found his heart his first act was to send for the widow geyser and say to her that she may discharge her debt to him at her own will and in her own time that she will be able to do since she has such a very fine farm and is shortly to marry rawl muller his second act jean lapsed into silence while franz's bewilderment grew of all the people of dornblatt who might have sent him a message emil gottschalk was farthest from his thoughts but the former greedy miser of dornblatt must surely have come home a changed man that he had given the widow geyser time to pay her debts when he might have foreclosed on her farm was evidence enough of that his second act jean went on was to compose a message to you it was a most important message that must be entrusted only to a most important messenger who was the messenger franz asked jean answered professor lutman franz reeled like a bullet-stricken chamois professor lutman was one of the finest men in dornblatt he was a great and kind teacher one who had struggled hard to teach even a stupid franz hale if he and his knowledge were lost then all the boys and girls of dornblatt who might learn stood a fine chance of growing up to be ignorant indeed 
there would be no one to teach them gene greb closed his eyes to hide the tears that sprang into them he said bitterly would that it were i and not professor luttman who lies beneath the snow franz suddenly forgot that the mountains might tumble if he spoke to the prior he flung himself before the supreme authority of saint bernard hospice let us go he begged let caesar and me go with whoever searches for professor luttman the prior said gently your spirit is admirable franz but this is work for experienced men you and your dog would merely hinder them no franz cried i can get about on snow it was caesar who found the very emil gottschalk whose message professor luttman carries when experienced men failed that is true jean greb spoke from his pallet emil would not be alive today were it not for franz's dog he was buried so deeply in the snow that men alone never would have found him your dog can find men buried beneath the snow the prior questioned yes franz exclaimed the prior appeared puzzled how does he do it i cannot be sure but i think he hears the heartbeat franz replied let us go we will hinder no one i speak for franz and caesar jean greb urged i have known both all their lives and i have never known either to hinder any one there are few men in dornblatt who can equal franz's skill on the snow anton martek said i also speak for franz he calls himself stupid because he is unable to understand that which is written in books but he knows well the arts of the snow and the mountains the prior nodded then go you too anton and father mark father benjamin will guide and may god go with all of you end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of rescue dog of the high pass this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org rescue dog of the high pass by jim kilgard caesar's feet there was a wind but it was not the roaring blast that so frequently snarled through st bernard pass and it had not tumbled the snow about enough to cover the ski trail left by father benjamin and jean greb it was a safe path for two men had already travelled it in safety rather than having to choose carefully a slow and uncertain way the four could now move swiftly followed only by caesar who found the going easy on a path packed by so many skis franz stayed just far enough behind anton martek to avoid running up on the toboggan the giant pulled father benjamin led the way followed by father mark there were ropes and shovels on the toboggan franz tried to swallow his heart that insisted on beating in his throat rather than in his chest an avalanche was as unpredictable as the chatter of a jay for all his vast experience in the mountains jean greb had not known this one was coming until it overwhelmed both himself and professor luttman no one could ever be sure franz tried to reassure himself by thinking of the three men ahead of him all were not only men of the mountains in general but of st bernard pass in particular there was no situation that could arise in the pass which they had not met before and with which they would not know how to cope franz told himself they were very sure of finding professor luttman but in his own heart franz knew how very wrong he could be an avalanche was a freakish thing when tons millions of tons of snow thundered down a slope it was somewhat comparable to a treacherous river there were currents that surged towards the top and those that bored toward the bottom even though jean greb had been cast out on top professor luttman might be lying at the bottom for all their ability to work miracles the men of st bernard hospice would never reach him alive if he were 
they would never even find him franz tried to banish such gloomy forebodings from his mind and might have succeeded had not one thought persisted if father benjamin believed there was a good chance of finding professor Lutman, he would have made jean greb as comfortable as possible and tried to find him and in the refectory while jean lay unconscious father benjamin himself had said there was no hope franz thrust a hand behind him and felt a little relieved when caesar came up to sniff it he was by no means sure that caesar could find professor Lutman, but he was positive that they stood a far better chance with the big mastiff than they ever would without him he tried to picture in his imagination all the places where the avalanche might have occurred and gasped with dismay when they finally found it the prevailing west wind funneled through a broad gully on the east the gully was bounded by a gentle slope but on the west the slope rose sheer for almost half its height before giving way to an easy rise the wind had plastered snow against the steep portion more snow either wind-borne or falling had gathered upon it to a depth of twenty feet or more it was a much greater burden than the slope should have held with almost a perpendicular wall and not a single tree or bush to hold it back a whisper might set it off and send snow roaring into the gully it was a death trap that any experienced mountaineer would recognize at a glance jean greb seeing the peril had chosen to climb above the steep portion on the west slope rather than veer to the east it was a choice any mountaineer might have made but something possibly the light ski tread of jean greb and professor Lutman, had started the snow on the steep wall rolling this in turn had set off an avalanche on the gentle slope and all of it had poured into the gully in the centre of the gully snow lay a hundred feet deep on the north end where the cleavage between the snow that had rolled and that which had not was a near perpendicular drop that varied between sixty and ninety feet in height the tremendous force of the avalanche had packed the snow to icy hardness father benjamin halted waved his arm and said i found your friend here franz he was trying to dig into the snow franz stared with unbelieving eyes at the faint scars in the immense pile of snow they could have been made only by a ski pole but a ski pole was the only tool jean had franz knew suddenly that father benjamin had been entirely right in bringing jean to the hospice a hundred men with a hundred shovels could not move that mass of snow in a hundred years it was better to save the man who could be saved than to let him senselessly risk his life for the man he could not you found him here anton martek asked father benjamin answered this is where the avalanche cast him up since he and his companion were traveling very close together he is sure that his friend cannot be far from this place anton said i know of nothing we may do except dig here nor i said father mark father benjamin said if i had a better idea i would surely make it known let us dig and let us have faith as we do so the boy seized a shovel and began to dig along with anton and the two priests he shook his head in disbelief for even though he used all his strength his shovel took only a tiny bite of the hard-packed snow despite the cold wind that snapped up the gully like an angry wolf beads of perspiration stood out on his forehead franz thought that an hour might have passed when while the other three continued to dig he had to stop and rest for the first time it occurred to him to look about for caesar the big dog was at the north end of the avalanche peering over the perpendicular wall he trotted anxiously back and forth and then leaned over to rest his front paws on a ledge suddenly franz remembered when caesar had found emil gottschalk buried in the snow anton martek and the two priests remained too busy to notice the boy's departure when he made his way to caesar's side 
the great mastiff wagged his tail furiously and stared down the wall of snow is he there franz whispered is he there caesar the dog took three paces forward and three back he whined leaned over again to rest his front paws on the ledge and then withdrew to his master's side franz studied the awful wall that suddenly seemed a thousand feet high and where a mistaken judgment or a misstep meant possible death and certain injury but caesar would not stop staring down it and only three feet below was the ledge where he had rested his paws franz stepped down widened the ledge with his shovel and reached behind him to help the dog down he sought the next ledge that he might dig out with his shovel they were halfway down the wall when the boy heard a thunderous franz franz come back he recognized father benjamin's voice but he dared not look back for even a fairy could not have found more standing room on the thin ledge where the boy and his dog stood franz reached down with his shovel to scoop out the next ledge and after what seemed an eternity they were at the bottom of the wall caesar ran forward and began to dig in the snow scraping beside him presently franz found the limp arm of a man cold as the arm was he could still feel the pulse that beat within it end of chapter 13chapter fourteen of rescue dog of the high pass this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org rescue dog of the high pass by jim kilgard the message the fire in the refectory's great fireplace roared the prior the canons the sacristan and everyone else who lived at the hospice of st bernard and did not have to be away on some urgent business were gathered around it jean greb who felt well enough now to sit up occupied a chair in front of the fire shaken and thoroughly chilled but not seriously injured professor Lutman lay on jean's pallet the prior said let us have the dog brought forth even though he cannot understand it he should hear the message all eyes turned to franz beside whom caesar had been sitting only recently the boy looked toward the door caesar who had accepted the stable but found the refectory much too hot was waiting just inside the door his jaws were spread and his tongue lolled he wagged his tail at franz and whined obviously an invitation for his master to open the door and let him out into the comfortable snow he finds the fire much too hot the boy spoke with a free tongue from a happy heart he wondered now why he had ever been overawed by the prior or any one else at the hospice beneath their sombre habits beat very warm and wonderful hearts if it were any other way they would not be here franz finished he wants me to let him out a true dog of the high pass the prior said very well franz you may let him out the boy walked to the door opened it and caesar trotted out gratefully he began to roll in the snow franz returned to his place the prior said all of us know of the miracle a miracle wrought by a young marineer and his dog and now we shall hear the message professor Lutman carries i have imparted the message to you professor Lutman protested you are the proper person to tell franz not i the prior laughed i am merely an onlooker here and i must say that for once i thoroughly enjoy the spectator's role proceed professor Lutman. very well the professor turned to franz do you know what i really thought the day i expelled you from my school you thought i was too stupid to learn franz replied no such thing professor Lutman denied i thought there goes an alpinist 
one who can never discover in my beloved books any of the inspiration that he finds in his beloved mountains it is truly unjust to keep him in school when he does not belong here i thought also that one day you would make your mark in the world i am just a marineer at st bernard hospice franz protested and how grateful i am because you are just a marineer professor Lutman said were you not i would have died in the snow they would have found you franz insisted we would not anton martek spoke up we would have continued digging where we thought he was it never occurred to any of us that he might be three hundred feet away and down the wall of snow that is true father benjamin agreed very true said father mark so i am alive today because of you and caesar professor lutman continued emil gottschalk lives for the same reason he wanted to give you professor lutman named a greater sum of money than the boy had ever thought existed i would not accept his money franz asserted firmly professor lutman said so i told him so your father told him too but both of us agreed that the hospice of st bernard might well use it now the prior and i have talked and the prior declares that you shall decide how that money may be spent franz murmured i would like enough to keep caesar in food so that he will not be sent away from the hospice the prior laughed if there was any danger of caesar being sent away and there isn't the slightest there is enough money to feed him for the next hundred years and a vast sum besides franz looked appealingly at the prior i am not worthy to spend a sum so huge you must the prior told him no one else can franz turned his troubled eyes to the floor after a moment he looked up there is only one thing i would do he said finally i would go down into the villages the mountain villages where people and animals alike must learn the arts of the snow i would buy more alpine mastiffs dogs such as caesar and bring them to the hospice i am sure you may find someone with sufficient skill to train them properly and i am equally sure we already have someone the prior declared his name is franz hale and this is a day of great joy for all of us think of the lives that would have been lost but will be saved after we have these these dogs of saint bernard end of chapter fourteen and end of rescue dog of the high pass by jim keelgard